exposed to on a regular basis? Well, you take a shower and you're exposing your hair to the water. Did you know that the fluoride in your water creates significant hair loss as well as acne in your skin? Yes, this is true, the fluoride. The fluoride that is supposed to be good for our teeth actually destroys our hair. So the first piece of advice I'm gonna give you is just stop taking a shower. I'm just kidding. What you really wanna do is just get a simple shower head that filters out fluoride, okay? I found a good one, I'll put the link down below. Now, I'm not an affiliate or I don't get any kickbacks from this company, but it's a pretty good shower head that will filter out fluoride. Now that right there could be the reason why you're losing hair. In fact, fluoride also blocks your thyroid and a hypothyroid condition can very easily stop your hair growth. All right, the next thing you need to know about is your shampoo, sulfates. Sulfates destroy protein and your hair is made up of 91% protein. So if you're exposing your hair to sulfate shampoos on a daily basis, you're literally creating all sorts of problems and inhibiting hair loss. So you really wanna make sure you get a sulfate-free shampoo. All right, those are the two things that you just need to avoid. Now, to understand hair loss, let's first look at the mechanism, how most top hair loss medications work. They basically block an enzyme to inhibit DHT, which is a powerful form of testosterone that tends to burn out the hair follicles. So testosterone turns into DHT, a very powerful form of testosterone, through this little enzyme. And so these drugs inhibit that enzyme. The enzyme is called 5-alpha reductase. And people that have too much DHT get this condition called androgenic alopecia, which is pattern hair loss, both in males and females. All right, so now the question is, are there natural things that can inhibit this enzyme? Because of course the drugs have side effects. And the answer is yes. So there's a couple things you can do. Uh, onion juice, which I put a video out on this one topic, is a potent natural inhibitor of that enzyme. So you dilute it in water, okay, like a 50-50 ratio, rub it into your scalp, and let it set for 15 minutes, and then you'd wash out your hair. I put a link down below the video that I did on this topic. All right, green tea, same thing. You would make some green tea, dilute it by 50%, rub it into your scalp for about 15 minutes, then wash it out with shampoo. Now the next um, potent inhibitor of this enzyme is rosemary oil. There's one study that I found that showed that this oil is comparable to Rogaine as far as the effectiveness for preventing hair loss. And so you would take rosemary oil, rub it into the scalp, and leave it on for about 10 to 15 minutes. And you would actually leave it in overnight, and then in the morning, take a shower, shampoo your hair. So rosemary oil is a potent inhibitor of 5-alpha reductase. Now another inhibitor of this enzyme is just zinc, okay? Maybe you're deficient in zinc, like a lot of people are. So the best food for zinc is oyster and zinc. Now another inhibitor of this enzyme is just zinc, okay? Maybe you're deficient in zinc, like a lot of people are. So the best food for zinc is oysters. Start consuming some oysters a few times a week. But zinc is also in red meat, so you might need some more red meat. It's also in seafood, it's also in eggs, but red meat and oysters have the most zinc. Okay, now we have five. The old-fashioned home remedy, apple cider vinegar. You don't want to put concentrated apple cider vinegar on your scalp. Okay, I'm just letting you know right now, it's going to burn your scalp. You want to dilute it, like one-third cup of apple cider vinegar to one liter of water. And you can rub it into the scalp, and it actually will help clean up some of the pores that may be filled with sebum, which is an oil, that can be preventing the follicles from growing properly. And also apple cider vinegar gives a really nice shine to your hair. In addition to that, apple cider vinegar is acidic and so is your skull. So apple cider vinegar can help reestablish the pH of your skull, which can actually support the friendly microbes or the microbiome in your scalp. You don't want to create an environment where you, the outside of your skin is so sterile because you have millions of microorganisms living on the outside of your skin helping you and when you sterilize or clean your skin too much 
you can end up with all sorts of problems, including hair loss. So this is why you want to minimize the amount of chemicals that you expose your skin to. Let's go to number six. What if you go on the ketogenic problems, including hair loss? So this is why you want to minimize the amount of chemicals that you expose your skin to. Let's go to number six. What if you go on the ketogenic diet and you start losing hair? What does that usually indicate? That usually means that you're not consuming enough protein. That's the number one cause. So increase your protein, okay? There's some other things you want to look at as well. Number one, trace minerals, especially if you are doing intermittent fasting or fasting with your ketogenic plan because we are very, very deficient in trace minerals in our food. Trace minerals are minerals needed in very small amounts, but they're very, very essential. So either consuming food high in trace minerals like sea kelp or shellfish or fish from the ocean and sea salt is a good one, or just get a plant-based trace mineral product will add more trace minerals to give the hair what it needs to build. All right, the other key vitamins that are needed in larger amounts when you're on the ketogenic plan are the B vitamins. And so there are a lot of links between a B vitamin deficiency and hair loss. So you want to make sure you're taking enough B vitamins. And so nutritional yeast is a really good remedy for that. Just make sure that when you're doing nutritional yeast, that you want to get it unfortified with synthetic vitamins. All right, number seven, cruciferous vegetables. If you have too much estrogen, that can affect your hair. This is why women, when they go through their menstrual cycle, tend to lose hair. This is an excess amount of estrogen. And so one of the natural uh, ways to help regulate estrogen uh, is to start consuming cruciferous vegetables. Another great way to regulate estrogen would be to take sea kelp because when you take sea kelp, you get more iodine and iodine also regulates estrogen because when you... Another great way to regulate estrogen would be to take sea kelp because when you take sea kelp, you get more iodine and iodine also regulates estrogen now one more side note on that let's say you're menopausal and you start losing your hair that usually is higher levels of cortisol related to stress and if that's your situation I put a link down below to your hair that usually is higher levels of cortisol related to stress and if that's your situation I put a link down below on cortisol because that's a very very important topic let's talk about number eight selenium next home remedy would be something to support a hypothyroid condition if you have a slow thyroid a lot of times you lose hair and one of the key trace minerals for the thyroid to support it and help convert t4 to t3 is selenium and the best food for selenium is brazil nuts and seafood and seaweed or sea kelp. Now, if you do sea kelp, you also get the iodine that's also good for your thyroid. And one note about that, um, you can have a hypothyroid condition from other reasons that are not related to selenium. For example, you can have 
high estrogen. Too much estrogen inhibits the thyroid function. You can have a fatty liver or liver damage. That can stop your T4 from converting to T3. You could have gut damage from antibiotics, from eating the wrong foods, especially gluten. I would say out of all the foods that is damaging to the thyroid, it would be grains, specifically gluten in the grains, okay? So if you have Hashimoto's, which is usually 90% of all hypothyroid cases, you get definitely need to avoid gluten like the plague out of all hypothyroid cases. So if you have Hashimoto's, which is usually 90% of all hypothyroid cases, you definitely need to avoid gluten like the plague because that will keep the thyroid inflamed and you're going to have a difficult time um, fixing that problem. Then we have nine. Increase your vitamin D. You want to get more sleep. So you want to start exercising to reduce stress. Stress is a huge uh, problem mm -hmm. with your hair. In fact, a lot of people, if you ask them, when did you lose your hair? After an emotional stressful event, because you're spiking cortisol, and cortisol is very damaging to proteins. Now, a couple things you can do if this is your situation. Start taking more vitamin D. In fact, you just need to be out in the sun more if you can do that. Now, if it's winter, it's gonna be, be a hard time, but. More vitamin D can greatly, greatly help your hair and lower your stress. Vitamin D3 can act like a natural cortisol hormone, but without the side effects. It does very similar things. It's an anti-inflammatory. So to reduce stress, you want to increase your vitamin D and or expose yourself to sun. You want to get more sleep. I have a ton of videos on that if you're new to my channel. You want to start doing daily walks and you want to start exercising to reduce stress. All right, number 10. In a lot of hair formulas, they add silica. Okay, silica gives the hair its strength. And most spring water has silica, like Pellegrino, and even most other types of bottled water where it comes from a spring is going to have silica. You can even buy silica-rich water, which is really good for the hair. In fact, you probably... Notice that your skin, your hair, and your nails will all just start growing and become very strong if you start consuming silica. All right, 11, the ketogenic <laughs> diet, as well as doing intermittent fasting. If you are female and you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, you have to realize that one of the big side effects is hair loss because you have this spike of androgens, and that's coming from insulin. So just by 
understanding that simple relationship and lowering the amount of insulin, you can help lower androgens and help prevent hair loss. So how does that happen? Well, start going on a low-carb diet. That's called the ketogenic diet, as well as doing intermittent fasting. And lastly, 12. If you look at a lot of remedies for hair loss supplements, they always add biotin. Now, what's this biotin? Biotin helps proteins in your body, especially hair. Biotin will help regrow your hair and prevent the loss of hair. But biotin is a very key B vitamin for the manufacturing of these proteins that give the hair its structure. And biotin is made by bacteria. Okay, so they always add biotin. Now, what's this biotin? Biotin helps proteins in your body, especially hair. Biotin will help regrow your hair and prevent the loss of hair. But biotin is a very key B vitamin for the manufacturing of these proteins that give the hair its structure. And biotin is made by bacteria, okay? So your own gut makes biotin. And so many people, after they lose the gut microbiome, start losing their hair because they don't have the microbes to make biotin anymore. So take a wild guess what food is loaded with biotin and can increase your own friendly bacteria to make your own biotin. Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut has a hundred times more probiotics than most probiotics. And the good bacteria in sauerkraut survives the acid in your stomach. Plus, it gives you massive amounts of vitamin C, which is also needed to help grow proteins, specifically collagen and keratin. So sauerkraut on a regular basis can greatly help you. We establish your microbiome in your gut, help give you vitamin C, and give you more biotin. Now, if you have a receding hairline, I did a very specific, important video on that topic, and I put it right here. Check it out. Fatima. Maria, Gesundheitsmanagerin, ist eissüchtig. Daniel, Gesundheitsmanager, macht nur bei schönem Wettersport. Fabian, Psychologe, ohne Kaffee läuft bei ihm gar nichts. Auch wir leben nicht immer zu 100% gesund. Und das ist auch nicht schlimm. Trotzdem ist es wichtig, insgesamt auf sich und seine Gesundheit zu achten. Hello, Health Champions. Cancer can be a really scary thing, because it seems so totally out of control. But what if you have more control over cancer than you've been led to believe? Today, I want to go over 10 signs of cancer, but more importantly, I want to help you understand what cancer is, how it develops, and the mechanisms so that you can reduce the risk of ever getting it. Symptom number one could be fatigue. Now, fatigue, we shouldn't jump to conclusion because there's a million different things that can cause fatigue, but cancer is one of them, especially if it's not helped by sleep or rest if it's not going away, and if you still have it, like over a period of six months, then that could definitely be a problem. And a couple of reasons would be that the cancer, growing the cancer is using up some resources in your body, and on the other hand, your body's immune system is busy fighting this cancer and defeating it. So it's like there's this war going on that's using up resources. But remember, don't jump to conclusions because most commonly fatigue is caused by things like stress and poor nutrition. Another thing that could be a sign is pain. It's things like headaches and back pain, and especially if it's chronic, if it goes on for a long, long time, and if it's not changing with body positions. So if you have a back pain, for example, very often you can find 
at least some position where you sit or lay down or you lean or you do something where you reduce or relieve the pain. But if it's what's called a space-occupying lesion, where it's a growth that's putting pressure on something, you may not be able to find any position that gives relief, and that would be a bad thing. Now let's try to understand a little bit about what cancer is and how these cells are different from normal cells. A normal cell can turn on and it can turn off. A cancer cell is a cell that used to be a normal cell. It's still your cell. But something changed, so it lost the ability to turn off. So this difference, a normal cell is called a regulated cell. The, the growth is regulated. It can grow and develop to a point and then stop. But a cancer cell has lost that ability. It's called unregulated <coughs> growth. And this difference is one of the main things that is characteristic of a cancer cell. An example would be if you cut your finger, for example. These are different layers of skin cells. So if you cut it, your body's going to start going to work making new cells. And it's going to create these precise layers with different functions. And all of these different layers have different types of cells. The cells are called differentiated because they have different purposes they all start with the same type of cell called a stem cell, but then as they <coughs> develop, as they mature, they differentiate and they serve their specific purpose. But a cancer cell doesn't do that. It is undifferentiated. So if we have a bunch of different cancer cells next to each other, they don't really look any different. They're just making more copies of the same thing. Another way of saying that is that normal cells will obey the intelligence and the order in the body, whereas cancer cells disobey. They have stopped listening. And the way a cancer cell gets that way is because there are some mutations. A cancer cell is a mutated cell. And something has altered that cell. We're going to come back and talk about what those different factors are. Symptom number three would be lumps. And this is one many people are aware of. Women are encouraged to self-examine their breasts on a regular basis. And if you find a breast lump, it could indicate a growth that could be cancer. But most of the time, it is a benign growth. It's a fibrous growth often called a fibroadenoma or a cyst. And it's not just women who can get breast cancer. It is increasing in men as well. It's not as common as in women, but it's quite common in men as well. And men can also get lumps and growths on their testicles. So that's another sign of testicular cancer is if you find a little irregular growth on your testicle. Number four, blood in the urine is never a good thing. It could indicate bladder cancer, kidney cancer, or prostate cancer for men. But more often, it's not that serious. It could be a kidney stone. It could be a urinary tract infection. That's probably the most common one. But it could also be from trauma or infection or toxicity that inflames the tissue. So any kind of inflammation is called an itis. So if you have bladder inflammation, it's called cystitis. Kidney inflammation is called glomerulonephritis. Or prostate is called prostatitis. Next question is, how does cancer develop? Well, it all starts with a mutation. And the mutation is a change in DNA, change in DNA sequence. And your body makes about 1 million DNA changes per cell per day. That's just part of daily operations. When we start counting cell replication, mm -hmm. making new cells, that number becomes mm -hmm. astronomical. You're making 400 billion new cells per day, because old ones wear out, so you have to make new ones. And every time you make a new cell, you have to copy 6 billion base pairs, 6 billion pieces of information and you have to do that correctly. So obviously, with that number of copies, it's not going to be perfect. You're making about 120,000 mistakes per cell, or per day on the whole, you're making 48,000 trillion mistakes or copy errors. But the body has some ways to deal with that. And if you make a mistake, the body can repair the DNA. So that's the first course of action. And it's a good thing 
if that's not totally perfect. Because if it was absolutely perfect, there would be no genetic variation. We couldn't change our DNA and adapt to things as well. But there shouldn't be too many mistakes either. But a few of them will slip through. And if that DNA repair fails, the next course of action is called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Most of these mistakes are not going to be working solutions. They're not going to function well enough to live, so they just die. But if that apoptosis fails and they survive, now we have a mutation. But the body has even more resources because we have an immune system. We have T cells, we have macrophages, we have phagocytes that can go and find and destroy abnormal cells, things that don't look like they're supposed to. We have a way of finding and eliminating them. And then if that also fails, now we could end up with something called precancer. Because just because it's a mutation doesn't automatically mean that we have cancer. There's still many steps left. So in order to develop cancer, we need two things. We need an initiator, and that is something that it's a stressor that increases the rate of mutation and the severity of the mutation. And those can be things like smoke in cigarette smoke. There are chemicals there. There could be chemicals in the environment. It could be ionizing radiation from excessive x-rays or be smoke. There are chemical initiator. And that is something that it's a stressor that increases the rate of mutation and the severity of the mutation. And those can be things like smoke in cigarette smoke. There are chemicals there. There could be chemicals in the environment. It could be ionizing radiation from excessive x-rays or working around radioactive materials. Or it can even be hormone imbalances that can promote more mutations and more severe mutations. But not even that is enough to develop cancer because we also need a promoter. That's number two. We need one is initiator, two is a promoter, something to drive the process forward. And if we have all of those present, so promoter would be something that feeds the cancer, because the cancer needs a lot of food, but it could also be something that interferes with the body's immune system and the body's defenses. And if all of this is in place for quite some time, now we can develop cancer. But even then, it's not a done deal, because it usually takes a long time, even after that, to where we actually have cancer or where it's dangerous. And how long that takes, we're going to come back and talk about a little bit later. Where it long time. And it's not a done deal because it, we can develop cancer. But even then, it's not a done deal because <coughs> it usually takes a long time, even after that, to where we actually have cancer or where it's dangerous. And how long that takes, we're going to come back and talk about a little bit later. Sign and symptom number five is weight loss. As many as 40% of people who are first diagnosed with cancer have experienced some recent weight loss. And it's not that it's dangerous to lose weight. This weight loss is due to a disease process. This weight loss is usually rapid and unexplained. It's not that someone is trying to lose weight. And it's often but not always associated with a loss of healthy appetite. The body just doesn't have the balance and the resources to process food. It is too far gone, and then you don't have much of an appetite anymore. In later stages of cancer, there's also something called cachexia, which is wasting. And this goes far beyond just weight loss. This is where your body is completely wasting away, basically. And this happens in as many as 80% of late stage cancers. Remember when I said that there are some cancer promoters. There are some things that have to be present to drive that process forward. So what are those? Well, we can get a clue by the way that they find these cancers, or some cancers. It's called PET imaging, positron emission tomography. So the way that they can visualize these cancers, and right there is one, is with radioactive sugar. They inject 
radioactive sugar into a person the sugar gets into circulation and it's mostly absorbed by tumors and cancer because these are like sponges for for sugar they live off sugar and they can absorb as much as twenty times more sugar than your average cell that's two thousand percent and then when all that radioactive sugar is in the tumor now we get a focal spot on that imaging and why do tumors use so much sugar because they depend much more heavily than your average cell on glycolysis on sugar metabolism they don't burn fat very well they don't use oxygen very well they depend much more heavily on the anaerobic process of glycolysis of splitting sugar and I don't know about you but I think this gives us a clue on what we should and shouldn't eat and maybe they shouldn't give these people toast and orange juice right after their imaging session maybe sugar isn't such a good thing other promoters are things like chemicals because they interfere with the body's defenses and cleanup process we have pathogens like virus bacteria fungus etc now these can complicate things and they usually don't necessarily cause the problem but they can aggravate the problem and they take advantage of a weakened mm -hmm. immune system so if your immune system is already weakened by sugar and chemicals and toxins then the pathogens are just going to make it worse and of course stress is a huge factor in promoting cancer because when you're stressed your body is putting its attention on putting out fires outside of you instead of trying to heal the inside of you. Number six is a fever. That would usually be a low-grade fever in the absence of you having a cold or a flu, and it's something that won't go away. It persists for, for weeks. It may not be there all the time. It could come and go during different times of the day, but it's very persistent, and usually if you get fever in the early stages of the disease process, it means it's a blood-borne cancer like lymphoma or leukemia. But if it comes in the later stages, more advanced stages of cancer, then it would be something other than a blood-borne. And very often we get the impression that cancers just sort of attack people and then it's over in a very short time. But the question is, that's very poorly understood, is when did this start? And we don't have exact answers, but we have a pretty good idea today that it takes a long time. So let's take pancreatic cancer. It is one of the most ferocious types of cancer. Once you get it diagnosed in the late stage, it's over pretty quick. But when did it start? If you had your first mutation, like one cell mutating, getting not a cancer necessarily, but just a mutation, and then we're unfortunate that this mutation continues to progress, then it would take about 12 years before we had a cancer. And there would be multiple progressive mutations, and it would take another seven years or so before it was an advanced stage cancer ready for metastasis. And then is when we get the diagnosis and we hear that we only have a short time left. But even though it is one of the most deadly forms, there's a lot of time in between where the body could do something about it. So while there is a huge variability between types of cancer and individuals, on average, we're probably talking 10 to 40 years for a cancer to become a real problem. Number seven is skin changes. And here's another one that a lot of people are aware of, that if you have moles that start changing, you've got to watch out. So there's an ABC for this. A means asymmetry side to side. So if you look at it and one side is kind of round and regular and the other starts looking different, then that's a bad sign. B is border irregular, so anywhere around it where it's not smooth, it starts changing and becoming irregular, that's not a good thing. C means uneven color, so if you look throughout the mole and it's uniform, that's a good thing, but if it's kind of spotty and different colors, not so good. 
D is diameter. That's the size of it. So if you look at it, and it's larger than the diameter of a pencil or pencil eraser, then that's something to watch out for. And E would be evolving. It means it's changing. You kind of had it for 20 years, but in the last year, it looks different. That's something that you want to get checked out. Number eight is changes in bowel habits. So if you have diarrhea, constipation, if there's blood in the stool, if your stool is black and or tarry, if you get abdominal pains or bloating, these could indicate a cancer or colon cancer. Now, if you, have, if you see the blood in the toilet, that means that the lesion, the, the problem, is very close to the exit, close to the rectum. Whereas if you get a black and tarry, that means that the problem is further up the digestive tract so that the blood had time to coagulate before it came out. But as you probably know, you shouldn't jump to conclusions because these are extremely common. So don't just look at this and say, oh my god, I have this. Most of the time, it's going to be due to things like food intolerances, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, or other imbalances in your biome, in your bacterial flora. Could be a leaky gut with gut inflammation, or ulcers can also cause blood in the stool or black and tarry stool. Number nine is dysphagia, and that simply means trouble swallowing. So if you have trouble with that, it could indicate that you have an esophageal cancer, thyroid, vocal cord, or a throat cancer. Because any of those could grow a lump of some sort that makes it more difficult to swallow. However, it's much more common that it is something not so serious like gastroesophageal reflux disease понимаешь <laughs> 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 <
ничего понимаешь как бы я тебе... ну и что сейчас сейчас я все прошу да ну вот это он имеет в виду ну типа того да зачем так как ты он тебя понял уже то есть неинтересно особо все равно если ты хорошо занимаешься а что значит хорошо ты все равно этому научишься а что значит хорошо заниматься что значит уметь играть на инструменте Ну, а себе так говорю просто. Кстати. Рассказал с вами, как Сумасшедшиеся, блин, да. себе так думает потому что Если я так, ну, ну это он не дает. Короче, ладно, вы как-то да, надоели мне уже просто. Не гнайтесь. 